much, ladies and gentlemen. Duzi dobrej buti z vami znovu v Ukrajini. I hope that was comprehensible. Okay, at least it was comprehensible and not as one my dear Ukrainian friend says, oh, it's like drunk Russian when you try to speak. Um, so, Jared, I very much uh, enjoyed that whistle-stop tour. Thank you. Um, I had a, a few questions that arose from it. I was scribbling away. Um, you, we, I think you covered America and, and China quite a lot. You went quite fast past Germany. And I wondered what, how you assess the likelihood of knock-on effects from a cooling uh, in the German economy. And indeed, just talk us through, you know, we're in Ukraine, we're quite close to the Eurozone. Uh, one of the big advantages for Ukraine is that access to European markets. Tell me what you think that the, the impact would be of a continuing downturn across the Eurozone. Okay, um, well, thank you. In, well, in recent years, um, an important positive in the euro area has been the improvement in labor markets where employment was created, started to be seen across more countries, in particular France, um, and the labor market conditions were improving generally. And that's fitted with the expectation in the markets that the euro area itself could grow at a stable pace, um, avoiding deflation, uh, but with low inflation. But in answer to your question, if the German economy were to continue to remain weak or shrink, then it removes a big um, potential growth dynamic for Europe, and one would expect the same factors that led to Germany slowing, and we're seeing this to some extent to be seen elsewhere. But one should stress that Italy and France slightly are driven by more uh, by other factors, and France has outperformed Germany recently. But on the pot, so there's a negative there, a spillover contagion effect. But on the positive side, um, it will increase the pressure on the Germans to ease fiscal policy and to play more of a stimulative role. In terms of UK-EU negotiations, I think the present state of the euro area politics or the EU politics and of the euro area economics makes, adds the pressure on the Germans to agree to a deal with the British. And so I'll follow quickly on, on that. We won't stay on Brexit too long, but if one's looking at the impacts beyond, surely a deal is a better outcome. I know you're perhaps more optimistic about uh, life outside, uh, the outside of being in the EU than, than other economic commentators, but how do you assess the chances of a deal at this point? Yeah, I think one of the big challenges, in my view, for Britain has been that in recent years, UK leaders have not really explained Brexit well to the global community. And hence, people have been taken in very much, and not taken in, have been mm -hmm. seeing the politics on the TV, and the politics are quite toxic. Um, so I think the UK has not really explained its position, and Brexit should be a very good opportunity, but of course, leaving anything you've been in for four decades um, is always naturally difficult. I think um, a deal is possible. The politics in the UK don't help. From a European Union perspective, it makes more sense to have Britain, if it's going to leave, to be outside sooner rather than this dragging on. It makes more sense for the UK and the EU to have a sensible future working relationship, not just on trade, but on other areas. And therefore, I think there is a possibility of a deal. But of course, if there's no deal, um, then it's more a case of n not the UK leaving without a deal, uh, but it's more likely that we just drag on and stay within the EU for another few months. That's the challenge. So if the U EU, though, says to Britain in mid-October, this is the deal plus no extension, mm. then I think that implies there would be a deal. And does it matter if you're either based here, this part of the world, or indeed your, your investments are flowing this way, do you care? Just to very briefly on this, and then we'll, we'll move on. Yeah. One way or the other, do you need to care, or is this just a psychodrama that you can safely leave to us crazy Brits? Yeah, I'm, I think uh, people's perceptions of Brexit are very much driven by the media at the moment. Um, there's a dislocation if you leave something, but I think it's important for people in the room to appreciate that the UK is the fifth biggest economy in the world. It has the world's number one or two major financial center. And hopefully that graph I showed you on labor markets 
highlights that the UK economy is very flexible and adaptable. And also, very importantly for people in the room in the financial sector, to recognise that London, uh, the City of London, has continued to position itself very well and is likely to, and in my view, will remain the major financial centre of Europe. So London and the UK will still play a vitally important role. But once you get past Brexit, you start to remove one of these tail risks that people keep talking about. So in that respect, it's a positive once we move to the next stage mm -hmm. and we remove some of the uncertainty. Last question for me before we open up to the floor so you can do some work and we've got a lot of expertise in the room. We'd like to hear from, I've just flown in from New York, as in literally flown in from New York. I think I got here about a minute before the session, which is what we call just-in-time delivery. Um, I was actually interviewing Mike Bloomberg, who I, I see Bloomberg is one of your partners. And one of the things that Mr. Bloomberg was, was weighing up as we discussed the election race, you can hear it, by the way, on, on the uh, Economist Asks podcast, a lot of interesting sort of economic analysis, business analysis in there. He says, well, you know, there's going to be a big pressure for more redistribution. Either way, you know, we've probably seen the, the height of the kind of Trump tax breaks. We've seen the American economy driven by that. It's going to be a very hard-fought election. Do you see an increasing instability in America in terms of that kind of compact with the markets and those particular policies, which what everyone thinks about Donald Trump do seem to have been quite beneficial to the US economy uh, and those who sort of in the end ride on the back of it? Yeah, uh, there are many different facets to that. I think let, let's deal with the positive. Um, in terms of the shift in the balance of power, um, Often there's a tendency for people to think it's just China, etc. But really, I think it's the center of power is moving from across the Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific. And that's from India in the West through to America in the East. And the US economy is still very dynamic. Um, and the whole fourth industrial revolution, innovation, uh, the UK as well as the US play a big role within that. So there is still lots of positives. I think the challenge w that we're seeing is something I tried to touch on, which is the aftermath of the global financial crisis and this shift in the balance of power means that some of the losers to begin with are those on low wages. T 20 years ago, um, or, or a couple of years ago, the World Bank did this analysis of what had happened over the previous 25 years as a result of globalization. And if you took the poorest person in the world in 1989, when you, I think you were probably in East Germany, when the Berlin Wall fell, to the richest person yep, in the world. Yeah, it was all down to me. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> and the richest person in the world being 100. Over that intervening 25 years, the biggest gainers were around 40. The emerging middle class in China, etc., And the 0.01% mega wealthy. But the biggest net losers were around 85 on that global scale. Still mm. rich by global standards, but they were the w working classes in America, Britain, and Western mm. Europe. Mm. So in answer to your question, um, policymakers in the States and are naturally playing to their audiences. But in answer to your question, yes, that redistribution, but it needs to come not necessarily by cramping and regulating. It's by actually innovating and getting productivity up. But it's a hard thing to do overnight. Far easier if you're fighting an election to say, I'll take from there and give to there. Right, well, why don't we open to the floor now? Um, I don't know if we can, can I get a sort of, the light's a little bit difficult, but if people, if you wave at me, I might take one or two questions together. There's a gentleman very helpfully with a white sheet uh, in the air. Do we have microphones? Uh, yes, just sure. Thank you. Land speed record, please. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jim Brook, Ukraine Business News. Uh, Dr. Lyons, thank you for your presentation. As you probably know, uh, Ukraine is the Europe's largest food exporter. Yeah. The UK is Europe's largest food importer. Yeah. If Brexit happens, uh, is there serious work underway for a free trade pact uh, between UK and Ukraine, getting the French and German farmers out of the way, so to speak? Yeah, um, well, thank you, Jim, for the question. Um, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on the ins and outs of that. So let me answer it in a more general way by saying that one of the, when one looks at the EU, um, one of the big issues is tariffs that the EU imposes 
on goods from outside the EU. And tariffs are, it's a customs union, and tariffs are highest on areas such as uh, food, clothing, and footwear, and autos. And you could say, if you wanted to be bland about it, say it was a legacy of the setup of the EU, uh, keeping French farmers, German automakers, and the northern Italian business community on side to begin with. But certainly, even though the EU then has done lots of food deals outside, the UK, when it leaves, has flexibility on food policy. The initial challenge, if we leave with no deal, is the farming sector, like the auto pharmaceutical sector and the f supply chains, have a big challenge. But then the big issue is what approach the UK wants to take on farming as well as on fisheries. And on this area, the government, but it's not clear that all parliamentarians agree on this, the government suggests that it's open to thinking both about a transition phase to help people through the transition and then a more radical approach. New Zealand's liberalization has been talked about uh, from a couple of decades ago. But the point is that openness starts to mean all sorts of possibilities. And in the area of this area, um, it's positive for the UK farming industry. But on top of that, on the trade area, the UK, particularly dependent on how it leaves the EU, will have more freedom, in theory, depending on the deal, to do our own trade deals with countries from across the globe. So in answer to that, if you add those two factors together, the potential dynamic in the UK farming industry and the potential for the UK to ha be able to be freer on future trade deals, then uh, the question you asked, the answer to that might well be yes, but I don't know if that is the actual answer in the minds of trade people at the moment. Let's take another question. Uh, yes, gentlemen, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this uh, very brilliant presentation. My name is Serhi Yagnic Ukrasi Bank. And um, I have two short questions for you. Um, one question uh, is um, about uh, the Fed. You showed us uh, the graph of uh, normalizing of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Do you think uh, Fed will continue to normalize uh, to reduce uh, the balance sheet, and uh, if it will, then what would what is the uh, uh, expected impact on uh, U.S. money market and uh, U.S. liquidity situation? And another brief question uh, uh, with regard to China: um, Do you have any thoughts um, about about the asset prices, about real estate prices in tier two and tier three cities in China? Okay. Thank you so much. Cool. Um, first, in terms of the first question, um, the balance sheet, which the balance sheet when it expanded in America and elsewhere was quantitative easing. When the balance sheet stabilized and started to then shrink was quantitative tightening. The initial focus most people had was on the impact on the economy, and we saw that it has had some, or we've seen it has had some impact. But your question relates very much to the market impact. And what I think we've seen, particularly with the repo, challenge the other week, which was not just linked to this, but also to tax demands and everything else, highlights the challenge with monetary policies, not only the policy path you take, but the execution of it. Uh, Mr. Potter, who ran the execution side at the New York Fed, left his post in the summer, and he's received a lot of coverage recently for basically indicating some of the challenges we faced. There are now talks that you need to look at the technical side of the uh, the balance sheet differently to the economic side, and maybe some are saying um, you need a bigger balance sheet. But certainly I think one needs to examine further the consequence of that. But what we're having is an interesting debate. But in answer to your question, it clearly has an economic and clearly has a market execution impact. And maybe when one looks at both of those factors now, it might suggest the Fed goes for a bigger balance sheet, or at least puts on hold tightening its balance sheet. In terms of China, um, the Chinese, as I mentioned, are trying to sort of fine-tune things. The scale of the Chinese economy is very significant, but in terms of two, tier two and tier three cities, these have become far more important in recent years in China and are becoming big on the global stage. Like Chongqing, most people have never heard of, it seems to me, is 32 million people. Biggest city in the world people have never heard of, maybe. Um, the former capital, admittedly. But what you have seen is that the Chinese policymakers are trying to uh, really stabilize things, but the challenge is they need to have a deeper and broader 
domestic market because you as an individual in China in the past could put your money in a bank deposit, yielding very little, in the stock market, which is very volatile and issues about corporate governments, or the preferable thing people did was the real estate market. And when Hu Jintao gave his major policy speech uh, in March of last year, the biggest applause he got in his three and a half hour speech was when he said something that would be very popular in the UK, is that housing should be living for living in, not for speculating on. Mm. And I think, in answer to your question, they are really trying to ensure that, A, they do not see a build-up of leverage of debt across the country, but they don't see a re-build-up of asset price inflation. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, who else would like to ask us something? So anyone a bit further back, you can give me a good wave. Um, and I will pick, pick up on I'm you. I'm here on, on the left. I, I'll take your word for it. It's, sorry, it's yeah, a blue yeah. light. I'm, I'm in, enjoying looking into, into it's it. It's complete darkness. I know, it's very exciting for <laughs> us because we have no idea, really. You know, you, you, you could do anything to us. We wouldn't okay. know. Um, on your right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Go I, ahead. I have a mic already. <laughs> Uh, good morning. My good morning. name is Alex Grinchenko. I am from Aeon Risk Solution. Uh, a question, trade war between China and US, it's more an opportunity for Ukraine or rather risk? Oh, um, okay. Um, I think trade wars are worrying to begin with. The, the thing about, it's a very valid question because if we look at what's happened at the moment, um, trade wars where they lead to higher tariffs, Tariffs are a tax, so they hit consumer spending in China and America. And then they also hit those previous exporters. But what we then see is a displacement effect, a new people coming along, Vietnam, Bangladesh, etc., filling the gap. So in terms of a trade dispute, the challenge with it is the contagion, because it has a negative impact on growth in two major economies, that filters elsewhere, has a ne negative impact on confidence, that filters. So you should not, regardless of where you are, underestimate the near-term challenges. But the opportunity, I think it's not just an opportunity linked to this, because the aftermath of a trade war is what's the level playing field. You're almost, I would say Ukraine is like that Roman god Janus who had two heads that looked in two different, di in opposite directions. You are very well placed to be not just looking and, and asked earlier about the EU, but looking towards where the growth regions are, and it's not just actually China, um, India, what's it, one sixth of the world's population is in India, one in 12 people was an Indian under 27. You've got great, and they have a big issue about water, about their agricultural area. So huge opportunities, not just linked to this trade war itself, but in terms of where those future growth dynamics are in other economies. Uh, you haven't mentioned Russia, Yes, and sorry. The Russian economy. I, I thought they and were going just, to talk about Yeah, it just struck me that we should at least have a, a, a brief word about that. Uh, lots of foment, lots of worries in Russia about the economy and also pensions and those big liabilities that the system has built up and not a whole load of reform has been uh, going on in the, I, I, there in the, in the Putin years. I mean, how much do you think that plays into your analysis of those big global trends you were discussing? Yeah, well, okay, I, I didn't mention Russia for two reasons. One, uh, I thought there were far too many experts on Russia <laughs> relative to me in the room. And second, I thought you would be covering it later from what I saw from the program. Um, Russia is a strange economy in some respects because geographically mm. it's so important. It, um, it's a bit like when you look at the Canadian economy economy, Canada is obviously a much bigger economy, uh, but uh, Russia is far more important geopolitically. So when people naturally talk about Russia, they look, talk about the geopolitics, and the geopolitics of Russia into the Middle East, as well as providing energy to Western Europe, are vitally important. I think the biggest challenge and disappointment economists would have about Russia is that Russia is not really diversified. Mm. And if you look at the other D as well, the demographics of Russia, um, that also suggests that future trend growth will be very, very low. So those two mm -hmm. issues are a concern. But when one looks at energy, if you look at global oil demand, Saudi Arabia particularly hitting the cover recently, but you've got America, uh, Saudi, you've got Russia, and then Iran uh, and Iraq. So Russia is still strategically important geopolitically and in terms of energy, but it's not really 
on the demographics or diversification side done enough to justify mm. being seen as a strong future growth economy, but nonetheless very important. And some opportunity for Ukraine in there. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Great. Uh, right, let's, let's, ha let's have another look. I see a hand. Thank you there. I think it's going to be the last I question. I think it probably yep. is the, l the, last, the last question. Yeah. Alexander Matvienko from uh, ICU. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, my question is, uh, seems like um, uh, investors now are really concerned about tug of war, which is going on between uh, monetary easing and um, the global economy slowdown. In your opinion, um, how high are the chances of central banks, um, uh, the leading central banks to win this war? Uh, do they have enough room for that? And is there a danger that uh, further uh, monetary easing will lead to currency wars? And this in turn uh, will lead to further escalation of trade tensions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, even though it's the last question, there's almost multiple parts to the answer, which I'll... Um, first, um, in I mentioned whichever economy one looks at, the outlook depends on fundamentals, policy, and confidence. But equally, one could say, in any economy, um, the policy mandate you have um, needs to, um, I would say it's like three legs on the stool. Um, in Japan, they talk about the three arrows. Mm -hmm. And because that's associated with Abbey, people tend not to associate it with elsewhere. But in some respects, it's very important, and I think vitally important for Britain. But in answer to your question, one leg on that stool has to be monetary and financial policy. Another leg on that stool, particularly given the redistribution argument and given the ability of governments to borrow at negative yields in some uh, rates in some places, is fiscal policy. And then the other leg has to be the whole institutional or supply side change. All three are vitally important. So in any economy, all three should play their part. Part of the challenge in the last decade particularly in Western economies since the financial crisis, is that the stall has been wobbly because only one part has really carried its weight, monetary policy. And your question then leads on to the fact that even though monetary policy has been the shock absorber, can it go on doing more? Clearly in America, rates just around almost up 2%. That means you've got room to cut. In the UK, 0.75%. It would suggest there's not that much room for monetary policy maneuver. The major dinner speech at the Euro 20th anniversary dinner this year was given by an economist called Blanchard, who talked about the need for fiscal policy to do more. Mr. Draghi the other week said fiscal policy needs to do more. But before you get fiscal policy doing that, you still have scope of monetary policy. It's not just on interest rates, as the other question argue, asked, balance sheet, but also you have what's called MIP and MAP as well as MOP. Um, nice acronyms. MIP is microprudential policy. MAP is macroprudential policy. Macroprudential policy has proved incredibly, incredibly effective in Asia. And then you have monetary policy. So you need to be thinking about these areas. So monetary policy can do more. But then it leads on to if you don't have monetary policy doing more, or if you perceive it can only do slightly more, then fiscal policy clearly needs, like that leg on the stool, needs to do more. Do you then have currency wars? Um, I think w currency wars are best avoided. There will be bouts where many people, particularly in a low inflation environment, think you will naturally want to have a weaker currency. But I think they can be avoided, but you need to look at the Chinese currencies I highlighted. That will be a key measure on this currency war issue. But at the end of the day, currencies have to be seen as shock absorbers. So as long as countries are not manipulating currencies, but are recognizing that currencies can go up and down, and you try and smooth the pace of adjustment, then I think we can avoid the currency war. We can still, to conclude, allow monetary policy to do more, but we do need other areas of policy spectrum to carry their weight. Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. I think we're out of time. We need in a room of uh, business and finance people to be on time and on budget. So we just about are. Uh, D'accord, thank you for having us. We look forward to listening to the rest of your discussions today. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Give it up for Dr. Jared Lyons and Anne McElroy. <laughs>